Good morning. Uh, seems that today many people claim they want to decentralize everything from the state to the brain. I'll so I'm going to <laughs> put some scrutiny on this thought and we'll thank you. Quickly go over the history of decentralization, but before that I want to take the chance that we're so many people here to gather some anthropological data. I want you to please uh, scan this QR code. It will lead you to a page. Go to the bottom, say you don't have an account, and put this code in. I want to just gather from you uh, what is your go-to example of decentralization or decentralized thought. For me, a few examples that came to my mind. Let me go a bit more for you. So for me, it comes the kibbutz, uh, Rohava, BitTorrent, Parody Utopias, Markets, and uh, Zapatistas. Now, the history of decentralized governance is not something that they're going to teach you in school. It's not very prominent in the mainstream media, and they don't talk a lot about it in uh, academic papers. Uh, the reason for this is that, historically, uh, history is written by the victors, and those who could write and moreover could be read by large sections of the population were often part of clerical, statal, or tribal elites, and they had no incentive to go against this narrative. Of course, in the last 100 years, from Daniel Bell to Alvin Toffler, uh, the word decentralization has been increasingly used, and it's even at the cornerstone of the EU subsidiarity principle, which is a fundamental law of the EU. The first uh, person to use it in the semantic way we mean it today was uh, philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville. So what he observed was that with the rise of uh, the nation state and modernity, uh, decentralization went from being a descriptive property of bureaucracies and administrations to an object of political contention, and it even became a state dogma, for example, for the Jacobins after the revolution. When he talks about it, he advocates for decentralization. What he says is that decentralization has not only administrative value, it also has a civic dimension, since it increases the opportunities for citizens to take interest in public affairs. It makes them accustomed to using freedom, and from the accumulation of these local, active, personal key freedoms, is born the most efficient counterweight against the claims of the central government, even if it were supported by an impersonal collective will. This impersonal collective will is very close to what we think today about uh, decentralized consensus. So what at the end of the day makes a community decentralized? There are many properties and there are too many to enumerate here, but uh, Vitalik in his article, What is Decentralization? He goes over three big ones. Architectural decentralization, this is the tolerance to, for example, a network, several agents uh, being down. There is logical in, uh, decentralization, which has the question, is the data ontology interpretation monolithic or not? So are all the user balances the same for all the nodes in the network, or is it like language where you can have multiple interpretations? Of course, the most important one that has already been very much discussed here is political decentralization, so the decentralization of power. Uh, how do we define this? Well, Ni Niall Ferguson is a historian, but what he says about decentralization and hierarchy is that we think about hierarchies as vertically structured organizations characterized by centralized and top-down command and control and communication. From, from being the opposite of a network, a hierarchy is just a special kind of network. There is only one path connecting any two nodes, which clarifies chains of command and communication. More importantly, the top node has the highest betweenness and closeness centrality. That is, the system is designed to maximize that node's ability both to access and to control information. Think of a pure hierarchy as in some sense anti-random, in that the promiscuous connectivity associated with the networks, above all clustering, is prohibited. What is important here is to think about uh, the system is designed for centrality. Now, uh, I want us to be very careful. Let's not uh, vilify and be against uh, the word power. Power can also have a very positive meaning. It is the capacity for humankind to act onto its environment. What is to be denounced is not hierarchy and power. It is forms that are in systems that are designed to maximize power. It is illegitimate forms of power. Now, how do we measure this thing? And it's important for us to measure because if we don't have empirical data, we can't have a discussion together. One of the measures that was proposed to measure decentralization in blockchain networks was by Balaji Srinivasan and his colleague, the Nakamoto coefficient. The Nakamoto coefficient just looks at different facets of a crypto network. So for example, miners, clients, developers, and it asks, well, if you remove one tomorrow morning, what happens to the network and how many of them are useful to control the network. So imagine you woke up tomorrow and there's no Bitcoin core client or there's no Infura. Uh, clearly, today, we haven't gotten to the level of decentralization 
we want yet. But even if we do get to that level, what does it mean? The historical record shows that always one group of power leaders replaces the ever. Anarent very astutely observed that the most ardent revolutionary will wake up a conservative the day after the revolution. So what we must do is actually be transparent about our goals, discuss them, and come to this consensus and try to inscribe them into the protocol itself. Now, not, it's not necessarily at the base layer, but we have to come to some sort of agreement. Uh, these goals can be very contradictory. We've seen what happened with you know, the discussion with Vlad and Nick, and I think what Nick uh, approaches is to say that any form of governance will inevitably result in an encroachment on the sovereignty of the individual. On the other side, you have goals which could be like what greed renders desirable, co must make unattainable. Of course, between these two visions, you have all the colors of the political spectrum. Fortunately, we're not in a violent system. We're usually between these two propositions, shit happens and heads roll. So what we must do is not be dogmatic. We must experiment and we must try out different systems to see which one suits best our needs. This dogmatism also has to extend to the notion of decentralization itself. So it is not in itself a goal. Uh, I mean, it is a goal, but it's not an end. It is only a means to get to our end. And if we're thinking about what level of decentralization we need optimally for an organization, we have to look at the pros and the cons of it. So I'll very fast to go over them. There is low cost of coordination. So to think about markets, you can coordinate millions of agents that don't know the state of the world or each other's intentions. And yet, with a few variables, they can come to a rational decision. There is a huge resiliency. If you try to uh, shut down Bitcoin uh, by closing down a node, it's like chopping the head off a hydra. And of course, you can circumvent the local knowledge problem. What this means is that by delegating decisions to those who are closer to them, you can get more accurate and relevant decisions. This is one of the local knowledge problem is one of the big problems with centralized planning, for example, in the Soviet Union. On the other side, there are huge uh, trade-offs to decentralization. Think about a uh, command and control protocol, such as an army. In only three messages, you can go from the field soldier to the chief of staff of the army. But in a decentralized network, it is much slower to propagate it. This is directly related to the decentralization, security, scalability trilemma. And there is also the appearance of local fiefdoms. I don't have to go over what happened in the last few years in the blockchain space, but uh, because we remove an actor such as the state that is able to arbitrate and even um, be abusive, you also remove that accountability. So people can be driven by economic incentives to maximize their profit for their own gain at the detriment of the network as a whole. Of course, you also have a problem of the tyranny of structuredness, which is that if you remove the jury hierarchies, you end up as in a dinner party with sometimes somebody monopolizing the whole attention and de facto taking the leadership. Now, what does this mean for projects in the crypto space? Do we want to have you know, the charismatic leadership of uh, Vitalik, who tries to step back from this position, or a benevolent dictatorship uh, of Linus Torvalds. Uh, I would advocate modestly for uh, more democratic and organic forms of governance. This is uh, very modestly what Pando is trying to do, and I won't go into the details of this. But I think what we all um, advocate for is changing society. How we change society, though, is not in the old vanguard party, top-down moralizing model. It has to be bottom-up, building tools that people can empower themselves and take power over back their production. Of course, technology is not neutral, but I don't have time to go into this, but I would advise you to read this book, Protocol, How Control Exists After Decentralization, by Galloway, that was from 2004, but really sees what happened in this space. So I will go straight to the takeaways from this. First, that initial decentralization can quickly lead to recentralization. Tocqueville again talks about this. He says that what in the beginning was a push for decentralization became in the end an extension of centralization. In starting, one follows the logic of one's principles. In finishing, one follows that of one's habits, of one's passions, of power. In sum, the last word always remains with centralization, which, to be honest, increases in depth. At the same time, it decreases in appearance. So let's not de just decentralize, we remove the ability for us to re-centralize power in our hands. The second thing, which I've already talked about, 
is that balance is key. And this balance between centralization and decentralization doesn't have to be an obsession. It can be about creating nested systems. So for example, you could have an ecosystem funding HyperDAO that itself is decentralized and allocates things without anyone having the power over this decision. And yet it can delegate some actions and some sub-budget to sub-entities, such as sub-DAOs, holacracies, companies, contractors, whatever form you want. The third is that you've got to be decentralized on all layers. We've seen in the Nakamoto coefficient that one stakeholder can decentralize the network, but think about nested protocol hierarchies. For example, if somebody could control TCP IP, a miner could uh, reroute packages more favorably to himself. If you're using centralized uh, storage, then you are also vulnerable to that. And that's why the work of Espresso and Altair yesterday was uh, really impressive in this regard. The fourth thing is that existing institutions will try to react. They can try to regulate and repress these things. But more usually, they will commercialize it, they will package it, they will give convenience to the tool, and they will subvert the initial values. This is what happened with the movement from Web 1.0 to Web 2. And today, the Web 3 has been called the movement for counter anti disintermediation. Lastly, decentralization is very, I mean, building decentralized system and establishing DAOs is a very multifaceted affair. So you have to consider the whole text and multiple space. What I mean is that there is not just, you have to think about, is my vision a narrow or wide vision of decentralization, but am I thinking about other properties such as autonomy? I will leave you now on a few words from uh, the original Taoist master, Lao Tzu, and I thank you for your time.